2009-10 was a revival season for LMU basketball. The Lions posted 18 wins, the most since their miracle run to the Elite Eight in the NCAA tournament 20 years ago. And LMU advanced to the postseason, hosting Pacific in the first round of the CollegeInsider.com tournament. Well, Max, you had uh, at 18 wins, most in a decade. What, as you look back now, were the keys to this turnaround for LMU? Well, let's just be honest. We also had 16 losses. But the key to the turnaround was, you know, we had better players and more of them. Mm -hmm. there's, uh, there, there's never been a good team with bad players. And sometimes the coaches get aggravated with me when I say this, but I think coaching is a little overrated because now obviously, you know, you got to get them to play smart, hard, and together, hopefully, but you better have players. And the key was, is the year before, we, you know, we had a very limited roster, albeit young people who worked their tails off and got better and better as the year went along, which is certainly laudatory given the circumstances. Usually when you're, you can't win a game, you get worse and worse, but uh, we continued to get better and better as the year went along the year before. But this year was a direct result of having much more talent at our disposal. More talent, so then how did it happen that they played harder, they played smart, they played together? Well, I'm not sure we always did all three of those things, you know, the, the, because those are kind of coaching uh, bromides that we use, right. but uh, uh, we just, I'll tell you, I thought the key to the season, and you and I alluded to it earlier, we lost to Montana at home. We had to get a 6 a.m. flight to Chicago to get into Notre Dame, and we were so tired and, and, and got in, and we really went through a very brief walkthrough and, and spent most of our time shooting and then went out and played a really, really good game against Notre Dame, only making seven turnovers and won that game, and that kind of catapulted us to, I think, the rest of the year. I think they started believing that, you know, maybe we, if not being an exceptional team, we can be certainly a tougher out. And then to tack on a win over Gonzaga, what did that mean for your team? Well, we were really pleased with the win over Gonzaga, but frankly, I was more impressed with the fact that we beat Portland two days later. Mm -hmm. Because Gonzaga, as good as they are, sometimes you suffer a big letdown after playing such a worthy opponent. And we had to turn around and play Portland, and frankly, their matchups, their particular matchup for us, were probably a little more difficult. Now, that's not taking anything away from Gonzaga. Everybody knows, you know, the, the, what they are and who they are and how they've set the bar so high. But I thought two nights later to come back and, 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 and beat Portland in overtime was uh, certainly uh, something that, w that uh, our players were pr very proud of. Uh, Max, how did you feel the team dealt with injuries? That was another key well, part. Well, we had, we had, but you know what? I always say, people, the winning team never has an excuse. I've never heard a winning team with excuses. It's always only the team that lost. And we did have a, a lot of injuries this year, but we weren't the only ones that had injuries. Now, we lost Edgar Garibay, our only true center, at the beginning of the year, and he was off to a very good start. And fortunately, it happened early enough that he was able to get a medical redshirt. But uh, then we had several other injuries during the year, and uh, mm -hmm. it, very, very frustrating. But we've got a new strength coach, and I think we're well on our way to getting that averted in the future, and certainly hope so, because you've got to know who you've got to play with and, and, and with, with whom you know, you're, you're going to have available on a day-to-day -day basis. Not, well, the frustrating part with our injuries was that we played several people this year that hardly practiced. Jared Dubois probably missed, you know, a good 15 to 25 days of practice this year and would play in games without practicing at all. Uh, same thing happened with Larry Davis. Larry Davis arguably was our best player going into the year, and, but he tore his Achilles. I know in his redshirt year he was dominant in practice, but he tore his Achilles and he was hit or miss all season long. He'd play a couple games and he'd have to sit out two or three, and uh, that's something that hopefully won't happen uh, next year for sure. Mm -hmm. What did being in postseason mean for the program? Well, it meant we got to play in postseason and we went 0-1. And, and it was very, very frustrating because I, Pacific, again, very good team and my hat was off to them. They had to play four games on the road and, and uh, they're very well coached and very well drilled. Mm -hmm. And we actually played very well uh, the second half, but at least it gave us a taste of playing in postseason and, and hopefully the sting from what happened and losing at home to them, although they were a good team, I thought they were certainly a beatable team and we played at our best. 
hopefully the, again uh, that'll catapult us to you know in, in the future that we'll be able to be better in postseason. Did, did your players react the same way you just did? I certainly hope they do. Young people usually are pretty resilient right. and bounce back pretty quickly. I know I, my wife gets frustrated <laughs> because losses stay with me, but wins don't. We'll win a game. She'll say, enjoy it. I said, you can't enjoy it. We've got to get ready for the next game. Mm -hmm. Well, she said, why don't you have the same attitude with losses? And I said, because I don't know why and don't want to try to figure mm -hmm. out why. But uh, the, the young people are resilient. I, I, I think they will uh, it will be better in the future for that loss. Is there somebody on your team, Max, that, work, that tries to help you with that? Is there some guy who's just so upbeat and positive that he's say, Coach, come on, we're okay? <laughs> No, because I, I really I'm that way too in mm -hmm. practice. I you know I always tell them we got to turn the page, we got to put this yeah. behind us. Now I don't, but I want them to, and I put up a pretty good front, you know. And and uh, and frankly, every now and then after a really tough loss, I'll my first you know we'll go to the locker room and I'll say you know the most important thing you can do tomorrow is make sure you get to that first class and you're there because in the long run. What you get out of this university from an academic standpoint will be far more reaching than this, this game will come and go. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do well in this class or if you, you, you know, don't pass this class, it could be, you know, you could be on the road to demise. And, and, we, and we just can't let that happen. And we've had, we've had a, LMU's done a great job of, of graduating their players and providing yeah. services and making sure that they see the big picture. And certainly that's something that we want to continue. Big picture, as you referenced, where Gonzaga sets the bar. But now that three others in the conference played postseason this year, do you see that as a good sign? Well, I think what's happened, some people feel that maybe Gonzaga slipped a little. And I think that they would argue that they haven't slipped as much <laughs> as the teams at the bottom have, have, have come up. And I think, you know, the, I think our, our, our league next year will be even tougher. Frankly, I think some of the teams at the bottom, and, and, and I don't think we have any bottom feeders. It's just certain teams have to, you know, when you have a league, somebody has to finish in all those spots. But I, I don't think there's any game on a given, any, uh, on a given night that's automatic. And, and I think that's what makes your league tougher. And that's why I think teams will do better in postseason play. St. Mary's, you know, being a good example. One of our best games this year was at St. Mary's. We lost by eight, mm -hmm. and we were up at halftime. And uh, I thought it was one of our best efforts of the year, even though we lost the game. All right, last one, Max, just to look ahead. You referenced strength program. Okay, that's obviously one goal. Another couple of goals that you're looking at when your team reconvenes in the fall. Well, from a particular basketball standpoint, we've got to rebound the ball better. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of ties in with strength because we had no seniors on our team mm -hmm. this year. We had three juniors, three, five freshmen, five sophomores, and uh, we've got to become stronger physically, and we got to be better. We got to be better rebounding the ball. Although what happened, you know, we had to move Ashley Hamilton, a six-seven, uh, more uh, kind of a hybrid three-four player, to our center position because we didn't have any other choice, and he did an extremely good job there. But he's playing out of position. Dubois, bounce pass. Here's Hamilton. Can he score over Harris? Fallaway jumper is good. Hamilton, big shot, six point lead. I tell you, Greg, Ashley Hamilton's impressive. 17.6 rebounds. He's 7 of 10 shooting. I mean, look at the defense. Elias right up in his cylinder, just stay, you know, stays on the ground, bangs him. He's doing that, Craig, against Rob Sacre, who's larger, Will Foster, who's a lot larger, Elias Harris, who's larger. We, we got to rebound the ball better, and we got to make sure that we uh, we understand that the, the only statistic that counts is, is the team that's ahead at the end. Mm -hmm. And there's a great, uh, great letter that Bill Russell wrote when he retired from the NBA talking about that the only statistic that counts is the winning score.